Pues yo creo que cada, cada uno tiene su filosofía y, y su manera de ver lo que es el fútbol, ¿no? Por ejemplo, el fútbol para mí es mi vida, porque el fútbol me ha dado todo. Y me encantaría que hubiese una investigación profunda de quién fue esa persona. Porque esa persona, no hay que hacer una estatua, no hay que hacer un monumento, sino debe de quedar ahí en la historia como uno de los grandes genios que ha habido en el mundo. Porque así, quien inventó la penicilina, quien inventó el teléfono, quien inventó la televisión, eh, la gravedad, esos grandes genios de la humanidad, el que inventó el fútbol, hay que adorarle como si fuera un dios. The origins of football is a history of signs and symbols, gods and games. Sports have long been the provenance of history's great civilizations, and it is through these that the game we know as football was conceived, shaped and refined. Three thousand four hundred years ago, in the country we now know as Mexico, Mesoamericans played the first team sport using a ball made of rubber. It was a game the Mayans later adopted. For them, the ball symbolized the sun, its power, its fertility, and in an act that foreshadowed football's dark and violent history, the losing captain would be sacrificed to the gods. The Chinese proved more forgiving. Su Chu, a popular sport of the Han dynasty, celebrated life, not death. Around 136 BC, Li Yu, a local poet, said of it, the ball is round, the playing field square, just like the sky and the earth. The ball flies over us like the sun, while the two teams face each other. The game spread to Japan and was renamed Kamari. から約約年ぐらい前に中国から仏教とかその他の文化とともに日本に入ってまいりましたそれが大体起源ですね。Highly ritualized, Kamari was more ceremonial than the informal game that later developed. Kamariは え、決まりのその晴れ会を それから丸を蹴ります。決まりは、え、だいたい6名ないし8名で蹴ります。そして、え、決まりの最大の特徴は勝負がありません。勝ち負けがありません。その8人が仲良く楽しく蹴り合うと。そういう楽しく分け合い
They wore the colors of their team and sometimes fought with opposition supporters. But the Romans didn't play ball sports in the arenas. Instead, such games were played for exercise and military training. I legionari romani giocavano l'arpasto, che era un gioco che a loro avevano conosciuto dai greci. I romani se ne appropriarono perché era un gioco che si contendeva la, la palla, si rubava. E si dividevano in quattro linee, gli astati, i veliti, i principi e i triari. Quindi quattro linee che sarebbero poi gli attaccanti, i mediani, i difensori e i portieri. This game, so familiar tactically, would have been taken to Britain during the Roman conquest. It's debatable whether they initiated or indeed influenced the games played on the island. But what is known is that a thousand years after the Romans left, the Britons were playing a variety of ball sports, foremost of which were the games of folk football. Usually played on the Shrovetide holiday or at Christmas and New Year, such games were steeped in pagan ritual. Their true origins veiled by one of the oldest, grisliest, yet best known football myths that the first balls were human heads. Sometimes an old custom has its origin in a source we cannot define or know and can be looked on almost as a, a secretion of history. There's this old story um, about Tusker, a petty tyrant who oppressed the people who bullied them. And eventually the ro people rose up in revolt against him. Um, he realized that time, the game was up, it was time to go, so he fled to the mainland of Scotland. However, the, a local champion decided that the thing to do was to put an end to this forever. Eventually he caught up with Tusker at the old city of Perth. He slew him in single combat and cut his head off. And uh, the local champion tied Tusker's head to the pommel of his saddle and rode north to Orkney. And as he did, these teeth cut into his leg and eventually infected it. And he got ill and more ill and eventually it went septic. However, with his dying strength, he managed to get back to Kirkwell and he climbed up the, the Merkel Cross in front of the cathedral. And there he threw the grisly head to the waiting people below to show them that their oppressor was indeed dead. He then died. And so infuriated were the people at this, the champion's death that they kicked around the head of Tusker in their anger and grief. The legend, whether true or not, is still enacted year in, year out by the people of Kirkwall, Scotland, making it one of the last strongholds of a game which for hundreds of years dominated Britain. The game itself is remarkably similar to other long-abandoned folk matches played on the island. The pitch is the entire town. The players number in their hundreds. The goals are local landmarks a mile apart. One goal was generally all it took to win the game, although that could take a whole day. In Kirkwall, two sides compete, the up the gates and the down the gates. Their struggle for the ball, or bar, is deeply symbolic. The tradition was for a long time that if the down the gates managed to get the bar, which was the fertilizing influence of the sun um, 
and the, it was the sun and its fertilizing influence, and they threw it into the waters of the harbor, then that would bring good fishing. And if the Uppergates got the bar to their goal, and they were mostly farmers, that would bring good crops, particularly good potatoes. And there was a, a small town in Norway that until recently phoned every New Year's Day to see which way the bar had gone, so they could ass assess whether or not there was going to be good fishing in the months ahead. In terms of roughness, there are no rules. It's hard, it's a hard physical contest. Perhaps sometimes old scores are settled, but uh, generally speaking, there is little gratuitous violence. For all its rough and tumble, folk football was more often than not folklore. Not so for the Calcio Historica played in Florence, Italy. Here was a game which directly acknowledged its debt to the ancient Roman game of Harpastum. Questo gioco, tanto in uso fra i legionari romani, fu introdotto anche nella colonia Florentia. Con l'andar del tempo i fiorentini se ne appropriarono. Calcio's history is as rich in antiquity as any of the English folk games. Florentines proudly recall the legend of the Sedio, an infamous match played in defiance of its enemies. In 1530, i fiorentini erano assediati dalle, dalle truppe imperiali di Carlo V e per non interrompere l'usanza di carnevale, di giocare per carnevale, il 17 febbraio giocarono una partita a scherno degli assedianti che ormai credevano Firenze soccombente. Such bravado typifies a game infused with violence a game where men test themselves and master both their fear and their opponent. In the Sedio of 1530, one player became the embodiment of these virtues, Dante da Castiglione. Una regola fondamentale era quella che la palla doveva essere sempre in movimento. Il morticino degli antinori non mollava il pallone, lo teneva con sé. E per il, il forte Dante da Castiglione prese calciante e pallone, che non era fermo perché era in movimento in quanto lo teneva in braccio, e portò fino alla rete avversaria e scagliò dentro calciante e pallone, marcando la caccia. Calcio was a game adored by all Florentines, yet it was also riven with distinctions of class and social standing. Mentre i nobili lo giocavano nelle maggiori piazze con eh, intensa partecipazione di pubblico, il viceversa il popolo si intratteneva a questo ludo proprio in considerazione che era il loro gioco e veniva praticato da tutte le parti, tant'è che girando per le strade di Firenze si può ancora vedere su palazzi o vicino alle chiese delle targhe di marmo o di pietra dove i signori otto di guardia e balia e proibivano di giocare appunto vicino alle chiese oppure per le strade a questo gioco spontaneo che tutti i fiorentini giocavano. Restrictions such as these were commonplace in Britain. Shops and homes were regularly damaged as the players rampaged through towns. Many died from their wounds. You can almost write the history of the game. 
folk game of football in terms of people trying to stop it, of local authority issuing edicts, royals issuing proclamations against it, colleges trying to stop their members playing it, because it's turbulent, because it's violent, because um, it poses a threat to law and order on that particular day when the games take place. As early as 1314, King Edward II banned football in London, proclaiming, for as much as there is a great noise in the city, caused by hustling over large balls from which many evils might arise, which, God forbid, we commend and forbid such a game to be used in the city in future. Edward's descendants were equally dismissive. Henry V waged war against it, as did Henry VIII, who believed it was distracting young men from their archery. Yet neither could stop football being played. And when, in the 19th century, football finally received a fatal blow, it was not an act of man, but of machinery. The threat that um, folk football posed to the rise of an urban society in the early 19th century uh, was, was serious in a way. You can't have the old games that have been played in a kind of pre-industrial environment played in the great expanding urban industrial centres. Local towns and cities pass acts and pieces of legislation to curb the old traditional games from being played in their own towns and on their streets. This is a world where football has to find a new location to be played. The old folk game is dead. The game was rescued from oblivion by the public schools of England, who were in turn endeavouring to save themselves. In the 1850s, most were struggling with falling admissions and violent pupils. Students rioted, burnt down classrooms, and attacked locals. The teachers, many of them vicars, were horrified. Given the mentalities of the pupils at the time, and given their lack of personal self-control, that frame of mind had to be changed, and so emerged as a form of social control, the process of turning hooligans into heroes. And the essence of reform was the playing field. And the rationale behind this was very simple. If you beat hell out of each other on the games field, you weren't quite so predisposed to beating hell out of the villages or the local inhabitants. Religion became the backbone of this sporting revolution. Muscular Christianity, the belief that sports were a useful aspect of religious training, taught boys that a fit body bred a fit mind, that fair play and teamwork on the playing field promoted moral fortitude. Each school evolved its own version of football. Some, like Harrow, favoured a kicking game, while others, such as rugby school, were allowed to handle, run, and hack down opponents. This rich diversity was to become the starting point for the modern game. I think the public school teams firstly kept the games going, and then the, pr probably the real significance is at the moments at which public school boys went to university together, uh, or when they left school, left university, and needed, wanted to carry on playing the games, and therefore needed, needed an agreed form of the games to play, and that's what leads us into the, the codification uh, of football. On the 26th of October, 1863, 11 London clubs met at the Freemasons Tavern to discuss a universal set of rules. Having agreed to call themselves the Football Association, an impasse was reached. The supporters of the Rugby Code opposed any law which might prevent handling or hacking, a bone of contention for those who wanted to see a kicking game. The deadlock was broken on the 8th of December, when hacking and handling were banned. 
It was a decision which left football with two codes, association football and rugby. Yet even after the Football Association was formed, the rules of the game were flexible. Many people misunderstand the development of the game. They think that in 1863, the Football Association was founded, a set of rules was created, and that was it. That wasn't it. If you asked a player in the 1860s or 1870s, uh, are you a football or a rugby player, they probably would have said, I'm sorry, I don't understand. What are you talking about? Because it was quite common for teams to play association in the first half of the game to play rugby in the second half of the game. You agreed the rules on a match-by-match -match basis. You could have 10, 11, 12, 14, 16, 20, as many players as the other team agreed. Such confusion was never more pronounced than when teams from England met teams from Scotland. Queen's Park, the Scots' greatest side, had pioneered a game which involved passing the ball between players, a style the English chose to dismiss. The English tended to, uh, it was more, you could see more vestigial traces of rugby, I think, in the way that English players played. Um, the English players, when they played Queen's Park, were very keen that hacking should be kept. Uh, deliberate kicking of the shins. Uh, there is a letter from Lord Kinnaird uh, to Queen's Park arranging a friendly and saying, let's have hacking, it's such fun. Which depended on what end of the hack you were at, I think. For the public school boys, football was a pastime, not a sport. As a consequence, the game lacked continuity, passion, drama. Football needed a visionary, someone who could take its essence and mould it into something irresistible. Charles Alcock is one of the most influential men in the start of football, was a boy at Harrow. Indeed, he was a boy at Drury's house, one of the houses playing here today. And when he left Harrow, he was instrumental in organising the Football Association. And he actually invented and started the FA Cup, which is based on the inter-house Harrow football. First played in 1871, the FA Cup is the world's oldest football tournament. The importance of the FA Cup is, is pretty clear. What it does is establish the really key element of competition and knock out nature of that competition as a way forward for football. And indeed, what happens in the World Cup now, what happens in the, the European League now, what happens in any number of worldwide and regional competitions, it's the knockout competitions that r really catch the eye and draw the crowds. The success of the FA Cup persuaded Charles Orcock to arrange the first ever international match. On St Andrew's Day, 1872, 4,000 people gathered to watch the home side, Scotland, take on England. With no previous example to draw on, the match proved somewhat makeshift. How did you know how to dress up for a game? It was the first international game. So the English players, they had white shirts with the three rampant lions on, but that was it. They played in the colours of the schools that they had played for. So we have knowledge that some players were Old Etonians, some players were Old Herovians, and they were playing in red or red and white, because of course in those days it hadn't occurred to people that if you all wore the same strip, it made identification on the field easier. Although I will say that even at that game, the English wore caps, the Scots wore cowls, the sort of hood you would get on an anorak, because it hadn't occurred to either team that heading the ball was a useful thing to do in football. England began the match with eight attackers and dribbled with the ball. Scotland fielded six forwards and passed the ball between themselves, a revolutionary tactic which would have a profound impact on world football. It's not important because it was the first game, because that's a statistical freak. It's important because you had two cultures clashing in the one game 
and the dominant culture, the successful culture, the Scottish passing and running culture being taken back through those English players. And that is why that game is the most important game ever played in the history of world football. Almost all of the first international players were public schoolboys, a reflection of the total dominance wielded by the upper classes over football. For soccer to emerge as the world game, it would first have to become the people's game. Apostles were needed, energetic men who could spread the game to the working classes. The church was important in sending out its young missionaries, its curates, its vicars, its Sunday school teachers, to persuade large numbers of working people to follow the working men, to follow the game which they themselves enjoyed. Uh, that cult of muscular Christians, of young men who were steeped in Christian faith but believed that physical activity best expressed through team sports was the way young men ought to play and express themselves. And what better, what cheaper, what easier way of uh, developing a sport than football, the easiest game in the world to play. Football spread throughout the country. Although it was in the industrial north, a working class stronghold, that the game really took off. I think industrialisation is absolutely vital. It's, it's very hard to imagine a mass sporting culture developing in a non-industrial non culture at, at that time. Uh, it, above all, it's an industrial culture which provides the regularity of wages uh, and the, the structure of the week, the working week, with clear breaks for leisure time, which, re which allows the game to emerge. It's no coincidence that in counties like Lancashire that you can begin to see the working class popular teams emerge almost at the moment at which the, the Saturday half holiday is granted. A half day Saturday liberated thousands of men from the drudgery of work and created an environment in which football could rapidly expand. As a byproduct of the Industrial Revolution, its significance to football was only marginally more important than the coming of the railways. The railways are hugely important. You, you could not have national league structures without railways. The notion of football teams traveling the length and breadth of the country, to a lesser extent, uh, supporters traveling the length and, length and breadth of the country, is just impossible without the railways. Throughout the latter half of the 19th century, football was parasitic feeding off the growth in industry and technology. As a result, new clubs sprang up throughout England, absorbing players and administrators. The teams that emerge in the uh, 1880s and 1890s, that, and many of them household names today, emerge from a number of institutions that already exist. It's men meeting in a pub and deciding they'd like to form a football club football team. It's men in the place of work, Arsenal, the Woolwich Arsenal, deciding that they'd like to play. It's men in, let's say, a railway company at Manchester United, North Manchester Railway. Um, it's groups of working men in the institutions they belong to, the church, the Sunday school, the trade union, the place of work, the pub, all the institutions that are basic to working class life, spawn the new football clubs. That's how the clubs, so many of which we know today, in professional form, that's where they emerge from. At first, most clubs were nomadic. Settled one day, uprooted the next. But when more and more fans began arriving at matches, clubs such as Aston Villa were forced to find a permanent home. Well, Villa, they rent a pitch for, from a butcher for five pounds per annum. And um, the butcher soon realizes that he's got something on his hands because he raises the rent to eight pounds per annum the following year. But effectively, what renting a piece of land enables them to do is quite literally put up fences and charge people to come in. And once you can charge people a penny here, threepence here, it means that you've got security. It means that you can issue posters and say, we are going to be playing on that particular day against that particular team. Like Villa, clubs from the North and Midlands were growing stronger and began to mount a serious challenge for the FA Cup. 
since 1871, it had remained the exclusive property of England's southern amateur sides. But in 1883, all that changed. If any one incident sort of summarises and captures the, uh, the moment of transfer of footballing power, the, the locus of footballing uh, interests, it's the cup final where the team from Blackburn beats the Old Etonians. For ten years, the public school teams had won the FA Cup, and uh, eventually, in the early 80s, along comes a team from Blackburn that consists of working men and skilled working men, and who beat the Old Etonians. Resting the cup from its founders, the old public school boys, and taking it back up north. This defeat may have marked the end of public school domination on the field, but off it, there was still a major battle to be fought. The Football Association was run by an upper-class elite whose amateur traditions were squarely at odds with the professional game that was slowly creeping in. I think as soon as cup competitions began to develop in the 1870s, uh, and as soon as crowds began to, to grow in numbers in the 1870s, it became inevitable that clubs wanted to become the top clubs and began to pay players. It became more and more of an issue as uh, clubs went further afield looking for players, particularly in Lancashire, as, as the Lancashire clubs began to go looking to Scotland as, as, a, as a source of supply. Preston North End were just one of the many clubs prepared to ignore the Football Association's strict amateur rules. The Scottish influence at Preston was extremely strong and throughout the club's history really this has been a Scottish club playing in the English league. By 1886 an average Preston side would have up to eight or nine Scotsmen playing in it. All sorts of means were used to disguise the fact that these are technically illegal professional footballers. One of Preston's main tools was to give people public houses. And when one of the signings from Bolton, having been given a public house, then married a local woman, Bolton supporters pointed out that Preston not only give a pub to people to play for them, but give them a wife as well. Seduced by letters begging their services, a steady flow of players were swept down the coastline and deposited on English shores. Kilmarnock had a player called Bummer Campbell, who was a very good player, and uh, word got out in Kilmarnock that an agent was arriving from Nottingham Forest to try and sign Bummer, and a deputation went down to the station, met the agent, rearranged him a bit, and put him in the next train south. But very often, of course, the raids were successful and people went down south to play. And uh, they were advertised for in sports papers and they were almost invariably referred to as the Scotch Professor. The Football Association failed to stem the growing tide in professionalism and in 1885 sanctioned it. This was to prove a vital turning point in football's evolution. It's clear by the mid-80s that there's so many people keen to play it and even more people willing to watch it and pay to watch it, that what the game needs is a regular cycle of play in the winter months from, what, September through to March, April. Uh, the Americans had perfected a similar system through uh, baseball, I think, through a kind of a league system. And that provides the kind of template, the blueprint, for what is introduced in uh, England in the late 1880s, and that is a league system that enables uh, football to be played throughout the winter months to allow the fans to go on a regular basis and still incorporate that element of competition, the win, the losing and coming top, the champions. William McGregor, an Aston Villa committee member, initiated a meeting to discuss such a league in September 1888. Based around 12 teams from the Midlands and the North, the first matches were not entirely successful. Accrington arrived an hour late for their game with Everton, while Stoke turned up at Preston with nine players. One missed the train, while another signed for an opposition club. 
Preston North End became the first league champions in the world, taking the title without losing a single game. The league boosted football's appeal immeasurably, so much so that for many, it became the focal point of their existence. And in the following years, stadiums rose up like spires to become the ever-present, tangible reminder of a shared yet tribal passion. In many ways, um, your attachment to the ground is far stronger than your attachment to the team and the players, because the players come and go. We know they're mercenaries, whatever people would say. We know that they're playing for the, because they have to earn a, a wage, and if someone offers them a better wage, they'll go up the road and they'll go somewhere else. But the fans stay there, they stay with the team, and the ground is the constant. It's the church, it's the spiritual home, that rectangle of turf to which we all pay homage on a regular basis. Having conquered the hearts and minds of the British, football's diaspora began in earnest. Football grows phenomenally, not just in Britain before 1914, but it, it mushrooms throughout Western Europe and in South America and other places too. There's no doubt that the men who are committed to the game are committed to playing it wherever they go. And of course they go all over the world. British businessmen, British uh, soldiers, British sailors, uh, British governors, British in, in, in some kind of imperial capacity. And also just ordinary working men. There's tens of thousands of working men who travel. And in a curious kind of way, they also become missionaries for the game. They hadn't been at home. But once they're abroad, what they want to do, of course, is to cling to the games, the culture that they'd left behind at home. And the most important kind of secular culture that they'd attached to was, was football. It's a game that the British deeply influenced at all kinds of levels by 1900, but particularly by 1914. This mass exodus of skilled British labour into the new industrial heartlands established the game throughout Europe. Most countries absorbed football willingly, gratefully. Yet in Germany, a nation with global ambitions of its own, the game was regarded with suspicion. In den Anfangszeiten des Fußballs war die ganz überwiegende Meinung über Fußball in Deutschland eine negative. Fußball äh, galt als ein englischer Import. Und England war auch unter politischen Gesichtspunkten äh, ein Gegner Deutschlands. Und man mochte diesen Fußball einfach nicht. Fußball äh, galt auch als unsittlich, weil Leute diesen Sport in kurzen Hosen betrieben und also Körper zeigten, wenn es auch nur Beine waren. Und alles das waren Sachen, die äh, gefielen den Durchschnittsdeutschen einfach nicht. Und äh, hinzu kam, dass der betriebene Sport in Deutschland eben ein ganz anderer war. Das war nämlich Turnen. Und Turnen war eben auch was sehr Nationales. In the years preceding the First World War, the gymnastic tradition became more than just a drive towards physical perfection. It became part of the Kaiser's nationalist philosophy. After the war, the Kaiser was replaced by a democratic government, and football, not gymnastics, emerged triumphant. Richtig populär wird Fußball, uh, denke ich, erst in der Weimarer Republik weil da auch die Voraussetzungen andere sind. Also im Kaiserreich war es so, dass die Arbeiter, also Industriearbeiter vor allen Dingen, keine Zeit hatten, Fußball zu spielen. Es, ist, es wurde sozusagen rund um die Uhr gearbeitet. Und diese Voraussetzung ändert sich in der Weimarer Republik fundamental, weil es zu den, mit den ersten Entscheidungen der neuen demokratischen Regierung 
gehörte, den Acht-Stunden-Tag einzuführen, sodass die Freizeit eben einen größeren Bestandteil des, des Lebens auch der Arbeiter äh, einnahm. Und da gibt es dann einen, äh, einen Massenaufschwung des Fußballs in Deutschland, weil die Arbeiter alle in die, in die äh, Sportvereine strömen. Germany's reluctance to accept the game was unusual, not exceptional. Football was England's great gift to the world, yet many felt the guardians of the game were overbearing, reluctant to relinquish control of a game they had invented. In Latin America, this struggle became the starting point for a unique football culture. At first, the game was played almost exclusively in the elite gentlemen's clubs. But all that changed when track by track, sleeper by sleeper, the railways emerged. Quiere decir que toda la configuración, por lo general, donde pasó el ferrocarril. Porque esos fueron, quién sabe, los inductores del fútbol en En, en Argentina como en América, ¿no? Y, y, y verdaderamente, en el caso mío, yo soy un gran agradecido a la industria británica. Y me preguntan todo el mundo, ¿pero qué la industria británica cuál? Digo, la del fútbol. Porque gracias al fútbol, por ejemplo, podemos subsistir con millones y millones de personas y de familias gracias al juego de fútbol. But the Argentines weren't always so thankful. Before the turn of the century, football existed in a vacuum. The British wielding a singular power over the game and its organization. Y el primer equipo que dominó en la Argentina cuando se organizó el fútbol con campeonatos era un equipo alumni de los hermanos Brown. Entonces, un equipo de origen inglés como era el fútbol en ese momento, dominado eh, por, por quienes lo trajeron. La Argentine Football Association, no era asociación de fútbol argentino. Sus estatutos, su reglamento, era todo en inglés. Having dominated the game for over 30 years, the English were toppled in 1913. Entonces, cuando Racing Club quiebra la, la hegemonía de alumni eh, y se consagra el primer campeón criollo, es como que se interpreta que hay una segunda fundación del fútbol y la fundación criolla. Es como que a partir de allí el fútbol pasó a ser argentino, pasó a ser algo nuestro. For Argentina, as elsewhere, football had become a means of expression, a shorthand for a communal sense of belonging. Empezó siendo una especie de nave espacial, una cosa marciana, venida de afuera. Eh, se decía, son cosas de locos que hacen los ingleses. Pero en estos países, bueno, pues el fútbol se incorporó a la vida nacional y cada país le imprimió su sello. Eh, que después se desarrolló de diferentes maneras. Dime cómo juegas y te diré quién eres. El fútbol es una señal de identidad, como todo producto de cultura. El fútbol también es cultura, les guste o no les guste a los enemigos del fútbol. Argentina's liberation was located firmly on the playing field. But in India, a country under British colonial rule, football would become deeply political, a stepping stone toward true freedom, real independence. Football had been played in the country since the 1870s, when the first missionaries arrived. The priests played a very major role in popularizing football uh, to get people to come to church on Sunday, especially young boys, they used to teach them football. And they used to organize football all over India, and especially the missionary schools 
uh, which came whether the Irish Christian brothers, the Jesuit brothers and various brotherhoods which came up and set up schools all over India and invariably the first game they introduced was football and uh, that is how the game spread to uh, different sort of parts of India. The other reason of course was also the British regimental teams and especially the soldiers, the Tommies who used to play football as a recreation in the evenings. At first, the Indians watched patiently from the sidelines. But all that changed when Mo and Bagan were founded. Our first famous club was Mohan Bagan, which started in 1888-1889. Now, they have a very peculiar history. They set it up in order to, it was something like the idea of muscular Christianity which was popular in the 19th century in England and Europe to, you know, train people to become physically fit and become good people. So Mohan Bagan had the very same ideals in order to make Bengali youth athletic and fit and muscular and, you know, give them some discipline on the field. So they set up a sports field. The Durand Cup, the second oldest cup tournament in the world, began in Calcutta in 1888. At first, British administrators banned Indian sides from the tournament, but then, as colonial attitudes relaxed, it became integrated. The Durand tournament in the beginning uh, was only for British regimental teams, uh, but football had become so popular amongst the locals and having separate leagues could have led to more alienation, sort of, you know, a type of apartheid type of situation. So this was a much more harmonious arrangement, getting the Indian clubs to play uh, along with the British clubs. In opening the game up to the Indian sides, the British paved the way to their own downfall. 1911 is the first historic landmark in Indian football. Mohan Bagan, 11 Bengalis, 11 barefooted players, all from Calcutta, became the first Indian team to win a major domestic tournament playing against British teams. They won the IFA Shield in Calcutta, beating this East Yorkshire Regiment 2-1. There were about 100,000 people. Most of them couldn't see the match because there was no proper stadium. They just stood in rows, thousands and thousands standing at the back. And very ingenious methods were used to convey the score. Uh, small chits of paper were tied on the feet of pigeons and they were flown to the back. And people would, after every five minutes, read the score that, you know, it's still one all, it's one nil. And, you know, the moves were written in shorthand so that people could know. And it was seen as a very symbolic win because it was the sort of first sign of independence. There had been the partition of Bengal some years earlier, so there was a, Bengal was very turbulent. And Mohan Bagan beating a British team was seen as a sign that India can do it. You know, that if we can beat the British on the football field, it's also time to lower the Union Jack. And in fact, when the players left the field, the Mohan Bagan flag was fluttering. All over India, people felt this was our game. You know, that we could play the world in this game. You know, the inferiority complex that was there that we couldn't play against what was felt was a superior race in physical prowess after having lost so many battles and all, all that vanished. Football had at last become truly democratic. A game so simple, so universally accepted that there were few places it had not conquered. The reason football becomes the global game, even before the First World War, is its basic simplicity. It just needs a ball and a couple of fellas playing it. You can, a, a boy on his own can play football up against a brick wall. If you've got two men, they can play kicking in. If you've got four men, you've got two teams. If you've got stranded men in, uh, on the, uh, on the uh, Arctic flow, you can play football if you've got a football. Occasionally, we had a football match to keep us fit. 
the team is coming out of the hut, our first Mr. Devon, Mr. Wright. In 1910, Day, Captain Dr. Robert Atkinson Scott led an expedition to Antarctica. He was hoping Mr. to become Taylor, the first Mr. man to reach Cooper. the South Pole. Evans, a heroic, Nelson, yet ill-fated mission. He took with him sledges, ponies, dogs, and a ball. And lastly, Captain Scott with the ball, who kicks off. Dr. Wilson and Lieutenant Bowers playing full back. This game was played on the frozen sea, thousands of miles nearer the South Pole than any other football game ever contested. The hard frozen snow on the ice gives a firm footing. The long shadows show how low the sun was at the time. It was midday, but the sun was only just above the horizon. 